Welcome back everyone. In our last video, we explored the concept of sustainability. Today, we're going to dive deeper into how we measure sustainability and examine some important models that will help us understand it better. By the end of the video, you should be able to understand various sustainability indicators, the concept of ecological footprints, and several key sustainability frameworks. So let's go ahead and get started. Sustainability indicators are quantitative measures that help us assess how sustainable our practices are. These indicators can be applied at various scales from the individual all the way up to the global. Let's look at some examples. At the individual or local level, you have an ecological footprint calculator. This measures the impact of your lifestyle on the planet. It considers the amount of land that's necessary to produce everything you need to stay alive and to absorb the waste that you produce. Similarly, we might have a personal water usage meter that simply tracks how much water you use every day. And that's for things not only for what you're drinking and cooking with, but also how much you use in your shower, what you flush down the toilet, what you use for doing laundry, for cleaning your house, washing cars, dishes, et cetera, et cetera. It's all the water that you use for all purposes every day. At the community or municipal level, we might find the AQI or the air quality index. This is a measure of the level of air pollution wherever you live. We might also find local species diversity counts, and this helps us assess the biodiversity within a particular area. Another municipal level sustainability indicator is the urban tree canopy coverage. This simply measures the percentage of a city's land area that's covered by trees, and it's related to temperature regulation and overall global climate patterns. We could also look at municipal waste recycling rates to track how much of a city's waste is recycled. Going up in scale, we end up at the national level. And at the national level, we might have something like the greenhouse gas emissions inventory, which is a measure of the total amount of greenhouse gases that are emitted by a nation. That accounts for industry, it accounts for individual actions. We also might have a national renewable energy share, and that looks at the percentage of the energy in a country that comes from renewable resources. So the greater the share of energy that is produced from renewable sources or clean energy sources, the more sustainable that nation may be. At the largest scale, the global level, we can look at something like the Living Planet Index. This measures global biodiversity trends and helps us track where biodiversity is stable or where it is most threatened and decreasing most rapidly. We also have things like the Global Ocean Health Index to help us assess the overall condition of marine ecosystems around the world. One of the ones that you're going to need to know how to use and interpret in ESS is called the Planetary Boundaries Framework. And the Planetary Boundaries Framework helps us identify the safe operating space for humanity with respect to Earth's natural systems. These indicators help us understand where we stand in terms of sustainability and where we need to improve. Let's look a little more closely at ecological footprint and biocapacity. The ecological footprint is a measure of the area of land and water that's required to sustainably provide all the resources at the rate of consumption and absorb all generated waste for a specific population. We can look at it as an individual, we can look at it as a small group of people, we can look at it at a municipal level, or we can look at it for a nation. In simpler terms, it's how much of the Earth's resources we're using to stay alive. Biocapacity, on the other hand, is the capacity of a given area to generate an ongoing supply of renewable resources and absorb its resulting wastes. It's essentially how much the Earth can provide and absorb. If an area's ecological footprint exceeds the biocapacity, that indicates unsustainability. It means we're using resources faster than they can be replenished, or we're producing waste faster than it can be absorbed, or both. Two specific types of footprints are particularly important. The first is the carbon footprint. The carbon footprint measures the amount of greenhouse gases that are produced, and we measure that in carbon dioxide equivalents, generally expressed in metric tons. The carbon footprint helps us understand our impact on climate change. In addition to the carbon footprint, we also have the water footprint. Like the individual water usage, the water footprint measures water use in cubic meters 
per year. It's an annual measure. This includes the water that is required to produce the goods and services that we consume. It shows the water that we use by the source, and it also includes the polluted volume of water by the type of pollution. You might consider the water footprint and the carbon footprint to be subsets of the ecological footprint. Understanding these ideas helps us see whether we're living within our planet's means or overextending our resource use. An exciting development in monitoring sustainability is the rise of citizen science. Citizen science involves everyday people like you and me contributing to scientific research and monitoring efforts around the world. Several different programs allow citizens to participate in sustainability monitoring. eBird is a global bird observation database that helps monitor bird populations and migration patterns. It's the largest bird database in the world. It's run out of Cornell University in New York in the United States. I contribute to it pretty regularly, and researchers use the observations of bird populations and bird sightings that people every day submit, and they use that to track biodiversity and bird migration patterns around the world. Another science project is called Globe at Night, and this tracks light pollution around the world. It helps us measure energy use and how the energy that we're using impacts the ecosystems around us. Some other citizen science projects you might want to familiarize yourself with are Frog Watch USA, which monitors amphibian populations and habitats, indicating local environmental health, and also something like the International Coastal Cleanup. And that helps us identify plastic pollution on coastlines and track marine debris. Another great citizen science project is called iNaturalist iNaturalist allows people to record observations of thousands of species of any kind, and they upload them to a database, and it contributes to biodiversity inventories that scientific researchers used at universities around the world. These programs not only provide valuable data, but they also help raise awareness about sustainability issues to the general public. Now, let's explore some key models and frameworks that help us understand and work towards sustainability. Remember, all models have both uses and limitations. The first framework we're gonna look at is called the triple bottom line. The triple bottom line includes social well-being, environmental health and economic prosperity and business success metrics. In other words, it's a way for businesses to assess where they stand on those three key components of sustainability. Its uses are that it balances economic, social and environmental aspects in business decision-making. Limitations are that it can oversimplify the complex interactions between those social, ecological, and economic areas. Another framework you should look into is the natural step framework. Natural step provides a strategic planning structure for organizations, starting with backcasting from a sustainable future vision. Essentially, we have a vision of where we want to be in the future, we look at where we are now and we develop steps to figure out how to get from where we are now to where we want to be in the future. The uses here are that it offers clear principles for sustainability, but its limitations are that it may miss some of the nuances due to a bunch of generalized assumptions and it doesn't really have very detailed metrics. So it's pretty open for interpretation. The circular economy model is something you might encounter if you're also taking business management or economics as a group three class. The circular economy model aims to eliminate waste and maximize resource use by focusing on product life cycle, innovation, and efficiency. Its use is that it promotes resource efficiency and waste reduction, but it can be challenging to implement in all sectors of the economy. There are some parts of the economy like healthcare where due to health concerns, the waste produced is challenging to minimize. We're gonna come back to this planetary boundaries framework. Planetary boundaries framework identifies nine critical earth system processes and sets quantitative measurable boundaries for each one of those. It focuses on the most critical parts and processes of earth's natural systems. However, quantifying precise limits can be uncertain, and it doesn't consider the social aspects of sustainability. It's really focused on the ecological aspects of sustainability. So the planetary boundaries framework 
while it emphasizes the ecological aspects, but doesn't factor in the social aspects as well, feeds into the donut economics model. This is another model that you might encounter in some of your group three classes. The donut economics model combines social foundation with an environmental ceiling. And that visualizes a safe and just space. That's the zone in the donut, the part of the donut that you would actually eat. The donut economics model integrates both social and environmental concerns in a single framework. And that's what makes it really useful. However, some aspects of the donut economics model can be difficult to measure precisely. One of the sustainability frameworks that you might already be familiar with before joining an ESS class is the UN Sustainable Development Goals, or SDGs. The SDGs are a set of 17 interconnected goals that address global challenges related to poverty, inequality, climate change, environmental degradation, peace, and justice. So the SDGs set common ground for policymaking. It relates to both less and more economically developed countries. And it pressures the international community to address inequality both within nations and between nations. However, some of its limitations are that some people will argue that the SDGs don't go far enough. And because it's the United Nations, which involves a lot of bureaucracy, it can be slow to respond and it may ignore or not consider local context. Each of these models contributes to our understanding of sustainability in different ways. Often, they can be used in combination to get a more comprehensive view. There you have it. Uh, we've covered a range of sustainability indicators and the concepts of ecological footprints, biocapacity, the role of citizen science and sustainability monitoring, and several key sustainability models and frameworks. Thanks for watching.